I want to introduce you to an idea. It's a, it's a, it's a strange term, but it's, it's this. And some of you may have heard about it. Some of you may have heard this term, you've been in church for a while. If you've been under good Bible teachers for a while, you might have heard this. Others, for others of you, it's going to be a, a brand new term, a brand new idea. Uh, it'll make sense as we go through it, but the, the, the term is this, a kinsman redeemer. The reason it sounds odd, because we don't usually, I mean, unless we're in the Ozarks, we don't use the word kin too much anymore, <laughs> or from Chowchilla. Oh, watch out. Kinsmen, one of my kin, family, kinsmen. Redeemer, the one who buys back what is under something, someone else's possession. The, it, it, the kinsman redeemer is a relative who redeems what has been sold to someone else. And literally, it, 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 in, in Genesis, uh, Leviticus 25, 25, the Bible talks about this idea of the kinsman redeemer. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative has the responsibility is to come and redeem what they have sold. It, it, it's, it's the responsibility of the relative, according to Old Testament law, for the Israelites to redeem as a kin, as a kinsman, to redeem what has been sold or given to someone else's, as someone else's property. And it involved little property, it involved people. Literally, what, what, what a kinsman redeemer is, is a family person who buys back or restores that which has been given away or taken away. The kinsman redeemer was a male relative who has responsibility to help a relative who's in need or in danger. So the way God set it up for his people, when one of his kids was in trouble, in danger, in need, when they experienced a lack or a deficit, God established this law, this, this, this allowance, for a kinsman, a kin of their family, to go on their behalf and to restore what it is they had lost. The kinsman redeemer was a person who, within certain parameters, who could even avenge their family member in the event of murder or manslaughter. It was their responsibility as a kinsman Redeemer to deliver, to rescue, and in many cases, buy back property that had been sold. There's a book in the Bible that plays this out in living color in beautiful form and fashion. It's the Old Testament book of Ruth. If you have a Bible and brought one with you, we're going to be in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth takes place during what's called the time of Judges. There was a period in Israel's life where they didn't have a king. And that was by choice of God. God said, I don't want you to have an earthly king because all an earthly king is going to do is tax you and take you to war. Right? He said, so don't do that. Let me be your king. You do stuff my way. It'll go fantastic. And the people in all their wisdom said, no, 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 God, we know what's best. And so right before Israel was given a king, they were ruled by judges. People who would make rulings on behalf of the people. During the time of judges, it got so squirrely with these people that at the end of the time of the judges, the Bible said everyone did as they chose. Culturally, there was no concern for others. Everything was relative. It was a time when people would say, well, that's your truth, but I have my truth. Does that sound familiar? And it was chaos. There was a great famine during this time. 
Resources were scarce, future was bleak, people were uh, oppressed, and they were in great deficit. Inflation was rampant, gas prices were too high, wow. invasions all around. And the book of Ruth takes place during that time. And it reveals this, that what seems coincidence, what seems as things just happened, that God has a hand even in the most difficult of times. Please understand this, regardless of the difficulty that you're going through right now, Please understand, difficult times do not mean that God is not working or orchestrating. Amen. Please understand that. In Ruth, in the book of Ruth, what we were allowed to see is God's unique and beautiful orchestration that serves as reminders to us of God's sovereignty, his presence, and his care for his people and his ability to buy back that which needs to be restored. Here's what happens when you and I go through deficit. When you and I are in deficit, we worry. But it allows God to show off. And so the book of Ruth is four chapters long. It's pretty short. And I was worried about how I was, I need, you need to understand the scope of all four chapters to, to understand the beauty and the power of this kinsman redeemer idea. And I was wondering, how do I explain this? And then I found a video. And so I'm going to show you this video that's going to walk you through the four chapters of the book of Ruth. It's seven minutes long. We don't have popcorn for you. But watch and understand that I'm going to come back and teach on the back side of this video, but you have to understand what's going on in the book of Ruth to understand this kinsman redeemer idea and who Jesus is. The book of Ruth, it's a brilliant work of theological art, and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter one opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled. And it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem, struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore. And so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard. And so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi. And she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. And she laments her tragic fate. Chapter 2 begins with Naomi and Ruth discussing where they're going to find food. And it just so happens to be the beginning of the barley harvest. And so Ruth goes out to look for food, and it just so happens that she ends up picking grain in the field of a man named Boaz, who just so happens to be Naomi's relative. We're told that Boaz is a man of noble character, and he notices Ruth. And so after finding out more about her story, he shows remarkable generosity to her. He makes these special provisions so that the immigrant Ruth can gather grain in his field. And in doing so, Boaz is actually obeying an explicit command of the Torah to show generosity to the immigrant and the poor. 
Boaz is so impressed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, he prays for her that God will reward her for her boldness. So Ruth comes home that day, and Naomi finds out that she met Boaz, and she is thrilled. She says Boaz is their family redeemer. Now, this family redeemer thing, this was a cultural practice in Israel where if a man in the family died and he left behind a wife or children or land, it was the family redeemer's responsibility to marry that widow, to take up the land and protect that family. So Naomi, she begins to hope that perhaps there might still be a future for her family. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan to get Boaz to notice their situation. So Ruth is going to stop wearing clothes of a grieving widow, and she's going to show signs that she's available to be married. And so Ruth goes to meet Boaz on the farm that night. And as she approaches, Boaz wakes up, and he's totally startled. And Ruth makes her intentions very clear. She asks if Boaz will redeem Naomi's family and marry her. Boaz is once again amazed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and her family, and he calls Ruth a woman of noble character. It's the same term used to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until the next day, and he will redeem both Ruth and Naomi legally before the town elders. And so the chapter ends with Ruth returning to Naomi, and they marvel together at all of these recent events. In chapter 4, it all comes together. It turns out, at the last minute, Boaz discovers there is a family member who's closer to Naomi than he is, and he's actually eligible before him to redeem the family. But at the last second, this family member finds out that he's going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and so he declines. But Boaz, remember, he knows Ruth's true character, and so he acquires the family property of Naomi, and he marries Ruth. Ruth. And so just at the beginning, how Ruth was loyal to Naomi's family, so now Boaz is loyal to Naomi's family as well. The story concludes with a reversal of all of the tragedies from chapter 1. So the death of the husband and the sons is reversed as Ruth is married again and gives birth to a new son, granting joy to Naomi. And this symmetry between the opening and the closing, it's even more remarkable. So remember, the opening tragedy was followed by a great act of loyalty on the part of Ruth. And that is now matched by Boaz's act of loyalty that leads to the family's final restoration. And this symmetry, it highlights the design of the internal chapters as well. So each of the chapters begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan for their future. And that's followed by a providential meeting between Ruth and Boaz. And each chapter concludes with Naomi and Ruth rejoicing at what's taken place place. This story is beautifully designed, and that design actually connects with a really interesting feature of the story, and that's how little God is mentioned. Right? The characters talk about God a few times, but the narrator actually never once mentions God doing anything directly in the story, and that's its brilliance. Because God's providence is at work behind every scene of this story, weaving together the circumstances and choices of all these characters. So Naomi, her tragedy leads her to think that God is punishing her. But actually, the whole story is about God's mission to restore her and her family. And he's doing so through Ruth, through her boldness and loyalty, which brings healing to Naomi's life. But not without Boaz, who's a no-nonsense farmer, who's full of generosity and loyalty. And so God uses his integrity combined with Ruth's boldness to save Naomi and her family. And so this story brilliantly explores the interplay of God's purposes and will with human decision and will. God weaves together the faithful obedience of his people to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world. And that leads to the real end of the story. The book of Ruth concludes with a genealogy showing how Boaz and Ruth's son, Oved, was the grandfather of King David, from whom came the lineage of the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, these seemingly mundane, ordinary events in this story are woven into God's grand story of redemption for the whole world. And so the book of Ruth invites us to consider how God might be at work in the very ordinary, mundane details of our lives as well. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. Coincidence? Each of the four chapters in the book of Ruth is God's orchestration 
of coincidence, from devastation to liberation. There's nothing in the book of Ruth by accident. No tragedy, no triumph. That's there by accident. Even though God isn't mentioned, God is behind every event. That's something for us to keep in mind. Because it feels as though as we go about life that God isn't around sometimes, right? He's there. See, God often orchestrates a deficit so that he can provide a provision. And in that provision, there's a whisper of redemption, which is what the book of Ruth is all about. The allowance of a deficit and tragedy so he can provide a provision and whisper to us about the redemption that he offers. See, the key message is this, that God will never abandon us or leave us alone in difficulty, that he's always orchestrating deliverance, always. Naomi sends Ruth to glean the fields. That means to pick up all the stuff that the the farmers left behind on the ground. By coincidence, she ended up in Boaz's field. By coincidence, Boaz was a wealthy relative of Naomi, whom they, by a through a series of divine coincidences, Ruth appealed to as the kinsman redeemer. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is exactly what Ruth fleshed out generations before it was ever written. Humble your, when you've got a deficit, when you've got a lack, when you've got a void, when you've got a, humble humble yourself. It's exactly what Ruth did. Ruth committed to Naomi and to working in the field. Listen, don't be afraid of the process God will use to bring about your redemption. It will start with humbling yourself. Humble yourself where? Under God's mighty hand, not in false humility. Ruth submitted herself to God's care. She said, I'm in a spot right here I don't know how to get out of. I'm in a spot right here I can't manage. I'm in a spot right here that's bigger than me. And I'm going to submit to God's hand. She said, God, I give you permission to do in my life and with my life whatever you deem best. I'm going to place it under your hand. That's hard to do, especially when we're in one of those spots. We want to wiggle out of it. We want to work our way out of it. We want to do something to make God do something for us. And it's just placing ourselves, submitting to him under his hand. And the promise is in due time, he'll lift you up. And he eventually did for Ruth. It wasn't quick. It wasn't easy. But there was an orchestration of events by God's hand, though it was unseen, to bring Ruth to her kinsman redeemer, the only one who could rescue her. And so the Bible says when you do that, then cast all of your anxiety on, don't cast some of it, cast all of it on him. Ruth had a lot to worry about. Ruth had a lot to be concerned about. But she trusted the graciousness of Boaz. She did nothing to merit his graciousness. She just responded to the invitation of a relationship. Why? Because God cares for her and cares for you. That's a promise. Ruth lived in the fulfillment of the promise of redemption. See, the big point about all, through the whole book of Ruth, the big point, and the big point about all the coincidences and circumstances in our lives that we find ourselves with, all the deficits, all the lack, all the loss, the big point of it all is that it's about Jesus. It's calling us back to him as our kinsmen redeemer, as the only one who can fill the voids, who can fill the deficits, who can fill the losses. The male relative who has the responsibility to act on behalf of the relative who's in trouble, who's in pain, 
and who's experienced loss. See, in the Old Testament, God, they called him Yahweh, he was Israel's deliverer. He was the one who promised to defend. He was the one who promised to vindicate them, both as their father and their deliverer. In the New Testament, it was Jesus who was presented as our kinsman redeemer. Did you know that Jesus relates to us as his brothers and sisters? Did you know that? They're God the Father, but Jesus relates to us as our brother and sister. Let me prove it to you. Hebrews 2. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So the one who makes us holy is Jesus by his death and resurrection, and the ones who are made holy is us who are sinners. We're both of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call you guys what? You ladies what? So Jesus is presented in the New Testament as our kinsman and redeemer, who relates to us both as our as, as fam, brother and sister and as God, who redeems us out of our greatest need, like only he can. See, Ruth was the one who was in trouble. Ruth was the one who was in need. And she requested of the kinsman redeemer to cover her both with her with his protection and his blessing. To redeem her and make her part of his family. See, when I look at the book of Ruth and think about this kinsman redeemer, I don't just see Ruth, I see me. Because I am the one who is in need. And I am the one who needs rescue. And I am the one who needs protection. And I am the one seeking favor. And I've asked my kinsman redeemer to cover me with his protection and with his favor. To buy me back. To buy my life back when I've sold it to evil. To reclaim for me what has been taken away from me. See, the Bible says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but the kinsman redeemer has come to redeem life in its fullness. Jesus, my kinsman redeemer, has had compassion on me. Jesus, my kinsman redeemer, has been merciful and gracious towards me. Jesus, my kinsman redeemer, has bought me for himself. Jesus, my kinsman redeemer, has purchased me out of my curse and out of my destitution and made me a part of his loving bride called the church. And God will allow or orchestrate deficit, loss, and voids in our lives to draw us back to himself as the only one who can fill those. for all who call on him in faith. Jesus will be your kinsman redeemer. It's Jesus who, re who pays our debts, who unites us into the family of God. It's Jesus who bought us back and bought back what we lost, sacrificed, given away. and Like Boaz did with Ruth, took someone from outside the family and made them part of the family. See, here's what happens. In difficulty, in loss, oftentimes we don't know why. Right? Why? Why this? Why that? Why in this way? Why at this time? I wanted something different. I planned on something that something different was supposed to be. Why now? Why this? Why that? Why this time? Why this process? We want to know why. And we don't know why. But we do know that God might be allowing or even orchestrating that deficit, that void, that loss to provide a provision that's found only in him. We try so many things to fill the voids in our lives. 
We try so many things to fill the emptiness, to appease the sadness, to chase away the guilt and the grief. This is why some people get into continuous relationships one after another who have no comfortability or ability to be alone because they're trying to fill a void. This is why some turn to shopping. It's trying to fill a void. This is why some turn to drinking or overeating or pornography. Every addiction is an effort to fill a void. And God will even allow those things, allow us to give ourselves to those things because he's trying to draw us to something that's beyond those things. To the one that can, the only one that can fill them. And if you're experiencing a deficit right now, it could be because God's trying to draw you back to him. My grandma, early Wednesday, in the hours Wednesday morning, experienced her full redemption. Her greatest need was healing, and God granted it when she entered into his home early Wednesday morning. To the song, I'll Fly Away. She experienced God's provision in beautiful fashion. I get it. This last Sunday night through Tuesday night, we were in nine of us uh, from our church and our ministry was in Phoenix. And after the event was over, we should have been at spring training, but um, I understand the uh, general managers of the Major League Baseball don't have quite enough money after going through COVID, so the season is on hold. We had a bunch of hours to fill between the event and the airport, and so I was invited by one of our pastor friends to go, in his words, plant freedom seeds in the desert. Go shooting. <laughs> so we went and bought a bunch of ammo, headed to the desert. What I was assured was a sure thing. They knew exactly where they were going. Two hours later of looking for a place to go shoot, I finally had to call it and go to the airport. Two hours. Nine of us. Stuffed in two little cars, driving around the Arizona desert, looking a place for a place to plant freedom seeds. You can imagine a little bit of consternation, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of like, seriously? Because of that, we took this little route to the airport, and right before we got to the airport, we had to stop and get gas. And after we got gas, I noticed my friend Cam talking to someone who was uh, inebriated about Jesus. And so I walked over and saw what was going on, and Cam handed the ball off to me and let me run with it for a little bit. You never do ministry alone. You always do it in teams. I want you to understand that. This guy's name was Porky. Uh, and uh, he, was, he, was, he was drunk. And, and, I, and I, I cut to the chase with Porky, and I pointed on his chest, and I drew a shade. I said, Porky, here's your problem. It's not that you're drunk. Your problem is you've got a God-shaped hole in your heart, and you're trying to fill it with booze. And you've had that God-shaped hole in your heart from day one, and the only thing you've looked to to try to fill that void has been alcohol, and it is absolutely destroying you. He said, yeah, I, I was, he was young. He said, yeah, I've got psoriasis of the liver. I've, I'm a diabetic. I, and I poked his chest again. I said, Porky, here's the deal. You're going to die real soon. And when that happens, you're going to face God. And when you face God, why is he going to say, come on in and share your master's happiness? And Porky said, well, I don't know. I said, well, Porky, I'm going to tell you how to be sure. 
And so we talked through that, but I know the guy's drunk. I, 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 I've, I, I've talked to drunk people before. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, when, when you're drunk, you don't remember everything that was said the night before, right? And sometimes you remember what you said the night before. And I said, Porky, you're going to forget most of this. But when you sober up, I'm going to do you a solid. I took out my wallet and I got a receipt from it. And I tore off my signature in the card. <laughs> and I wrote on the back of the receipt, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm a drunk. And I'm sorry for my sin. And I believe you died on the cross so I could be forgiven. I don't really know what that means, but I'm going to ask you to come into my life and make me a new creation. And I folded it up. I said, Porky, when you get sober, put it in his pocket, I want you to read this prayer and think about it. See, Porky had this hole in his heart, this deficit that God allowed. Porky was trying to fill it with something that was never going to fill it. And God allows those deficits in our life so we'll turn to him, the only one who can fill it. Porky said, is that prayer the prayer that Joel Olstein prays? <laughs> he said, do you know Joel Olstein? <laughs> I said, yeah, Porky, I know Joel. And he told me to tell you, don't send him any money. He's got enough. I said, when you get sober, you read this prayer and you think about it. It will not cure your health. But it will be your ticket into eternity. See, we all have our huddles. And we also have those divine appointments. Everybody you meet has a hole and a void. Everybody. And God allows those to draw us back to him, the only one who can fill them. I don't know what's going to come of my and Cam's conversation with Porky. But I do know that God's word doesn't return void. I don't know what's going to happen to Porky. But I do know, Jeremiah 1.12, that God says, I am alert and active, watching after my word to perform it. That's what I do know. I do know that Porky's got a deficit of void and a hole in his life that he's tried to fill with booze. I do know that the Father wants that deficit and void to draw him to the provision of Jesus. Some of the coincidences in our lives. We don't know up front what they'll lead to. But we do know, I do know, that had we not had that two-hour jaunt through the deserts of Arizona, we would not be in that place at that time to talk to Porky. What I do know is this, that my slides aren't coming up anymore. Here's what I know, that God is at work in coincidence, orchestrating events to give people a chance to get to know him. That's what I know. I don't know what your particular deficit is right now, but I do know that God will allow it and sometimes actually orchestrate it to get your attention, to see that he is your provision. So listen, thank God for the deficit you have right now. Thank God for the hole that you have. Don't rush past it. And don't be fearful of it. Don't try to fill it with anything except drawing close to Jesus. Realize that that deficit is your setup for God's provision. Do you understand? Don't rush past this. It's your setup for God's provision in your life. And know that God's provision in your deficit will serve as his revelation in your life. The way he fills that deficit in your heart right now will serve as his revelation in your life. God is whispering to you, I am your kinsman redeemer. He's whispering to you, I am for you 
and I am your rescuer. And he's shouting to you in your deficit, pay attention to me. Come to me by faith in my son. We want God to step in and do something to get us out of it. God says, I got you in it because I want you to come to me. Do you understand? Every deficit in Ruth, in the story of Ruth, was to lead her to the one who would be her kinsman redeemer. The only one who could beat her need. Don't miss him. I want you to pray with me. Father, thank you that you don't leave us alone in our need. Thank you that you don't leave us alone in the deficits we have in life. Thank you that you allow them and sometimes orchestrate them for the purpose of bringing us to you. Father, I pray in this moment that all of us, we have those holes, we have those needs, we have those things that we feel are lacking. Would you help us to allow you to be enough? To just allow you to be enough. Help us not to fill them with other things. Help us not to try to fill them with other people. Father, would you just be enough? You are enough. Would you allow us to trust you that you are enough? God, we believe this. We know this. Would you help our unbelief at the same time? We know you. We believe you. Would you help our unbelief at the same time? We know your word. We believe your word. Would you help our unbelief at the same time? May our faith be more than words. May our faith be more than anthem. May our faith be more than sentiment. May our faith be more than statement. May our faith be a living hope in a living God, in the provision of resurrection, in yours and in ours, fulfilling every need, fulfilling every hole, fulfilling every lack with life, an abundant life in this world and certainly in the one that's waiting for us. We love you, Jesus. You are our kinsman redeemer. Thank you. In your name I pray, amen.